Everybody say, this is for everyone. Man, you don't want to miss it. Hey, would you indulge me for just a moment and help me welcome all the campuses, even the Kenya campus, online campus, and Sanford, Hillsboro, Garner. Can you just welcome all of the campuses? If I haven't met you, my name is Benji. I get the awesome privilege of serving as one of the pastors around here, and we're just so glad you're here. Um, hey, got a question for you. What's Easter about? Well, what, what's, what is Easter all about? If, if you're new around here, you, you, I should probably tell you on the front end, this is not your mama's church. We're, we're a little different. Um, nothing against your mama's church. I love all churches. I believe God uses all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people. Um, but, uh, you know, we're not a traditional church, and traditional churches have things like Sunday schools and robes and choirs and all those kinds of things. I uh, heard from a pastor recently who pastors a traditional church. They have Sunday school. We don't have Sunday school. And uh, they, they, he pastors a Sunday school church, and uh, the Sunday before Easter, which was last week. Sunday school teacher went into the class and she was gonna get her class ready for Easter. So she gathered the students around and she said, hey, Easter's coming. Who can tell the class what Easter's all about? One little girl raised her hand. She said, I got it. Easter's when we get together and we eat turkey and we talk about the pilgrims. <laughs> Sunday school teacher was like, oh, Lord, help me. No, no, good try. No, good try. Anybody else want to take a try? And another kid goes, little Johnny goes, oh yeah, that's easy. Easter is about the time when we decorate a Christmas tree and we give gifts to everyone. She said, oh Lord, what is this world coming to? But finally, one little girl, she raised her hand. She goes, I know what it is. Easter is about that time when, when Jesus was killed on a cross and they put him in a tomb. And the teacher thought, oh, thank you, Jesus. But then the little kid kept going. She goes, and then we gather around the tomb and we wait for Jesus to come out. And if he sees his shadow, he goes back in and we got six weeks of winter. <laughs> <laughs> Kids, man, they say the darndest things. Well, what, what is Easter about? I believe Easter is about a joyful catastrophe. I wanna play with those words a little bit with you today. I wanna ask you to put your thinking caps on and just think with me today about Easter, maybe in a different kind of way. You guys heard of uh, a guy by the name of J.R.R. Tolkien? Y'all have heard that name? He's most famous for his fantasy works like The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. J.R.R. Tolkien was a friend of C.S. Lewis. We've all heard of C.S. Lewis. And uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, as he talked about this occasion that we've gathered for today, he, he talked about it, he created a word, and I love words, and maybe you do as well, but I'm gonna teach you a new word today. He, he talked about it in terms of a eucatastrophe. A eucatastrophe, you're like, what are you talking about? First of all, say it with me, then I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Ready, go, eucatastrophe. It, he, he combines two words, Eucharist, and those of you who grew up in the traditional church, you know that word, Eucharist. That's when, that's when the priest typically or the pastor in the traditional churches will, will serve communion. It's Eucharist. Eucharist literally means God's good gift. And I don't have to tell you what catastrophe means. We all know what catastrophe means. Heck, we've all lived it for the last year, right? And he, and he joins these two words. And, 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 and to frame it, he says this, there's a kind of story that triumphs over all other stories. A story that brings us unbelievable joy. There's always some incredible, hopeless situation, and then out of nowhere, victory is snatched out of the jaws of death. Eucharist and catastrophes. He brings these words together and he says this, a eucatastrophe is a devastating catastrophe out of which everlasting joy is born. I love these words, a joyful catastrophe, right? A tragedy that turns out to be triumphant. And then, then he says this, I love this. He said, there's a bass string in the human heart. For those of you who are artists out there, any musicians out there, he said, he said there's a bass string to the human heart. And all the little eucatastrophes can kind of make it reverberate a little. A little bit, but they can't pluck it fully. Then he says this, the gospel story though is the only story that will pluck that string so that the whole heart never stops reverberating and vibrating with joy. That's what Easter is all about. Now, I don't know about you, but I can think of no other Easter in my ministry life, in my Christian life, where we needed to celebrate hope more than this Easter. 
We have lived in a very difficult season. In fact, I don't know about you, but I can say, you know, unequivocally that 2020 was the hardest year of my life. Hardest year of this church's life. It has been very difficult, which is why I've been so looking forward to this particular celebration. God has brought us through. And I don't know if you've done this recently. Heck, maybe you have not done it at all. But I think you should probably thank God that you're still here. Amen? You made it through. Or at least I, we made it through today, right? We never know what tomorrow holds. But here we are. And look around. God is using us to grow his church out of a eucatastrophe, if you will. And 2020, if it causes us to ask ourselves anything, I'm sure it's caused you to ask at some point in time in the last 12 months, what am I really counting on? Let that just hang out there for a moment. What am I counting on to make it through this thing called life and particularly this season that we've been in? Here's another way of asking the question. Am I building my life on a foundation that's solid enough that circumstances beyond my control, even a global pandemic, cannot take it away. That's why I've been looking so forward to this celebration. This is a time where we gather around to remember that the only one capable, come on, of sustaining a human life, the only one capable of reverberating that heart with a joy that is everlasting is Jesus, and we're here to celebrate him today. He's that good. I mean, think about it. Come on, come on. For 2,000 years now, for two millennia, people have not gather, gathered around and said, the stock market has risen. It is risen indeed, right? They haven't gathered around to say, Amazon stock has risen again. It is risen indeed. No, 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 no. We gather around to testify, to bear witness to the fact that Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Can I get an amen? Now, yeah, you can celebrate and clap for that because he deserves it all. Now, in the Old Testament, they were going through a difficult season like we've been going through. And I think particularly about the prophet Isaiah. And if you wanna open somewhere in your Bible, go ahead and open to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64 comes to us in a time where ancient Israel, they too were in dire straits. They had experienced a bunch of gloom and doom as we have. And Isaiah, probably under an open sky, not in a building like this, I've, I've studied his language and it seems like he's probably looking up to an open sky. And he says this, he said, oh God, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your what church? At your what? Presence. Now circle that word rend because that's what I want us to camp out on today. Rend, R-E-N-D. Isaiah looks up to heaven. He says, oh God, we're hurting down here. It's hard down here. I don't sense your presence that much anymore. There's sickness everywhere. It's a war-torn world. We know what that's like. There's racism. There's bigotry. There's violence. There's sex trafficking. You name it. Oh God, that you would, and here's the word that, that I want to think about, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Now that word rend literally means to tear to pieces in anticipation of excitement or mourning. It's also used 63 times in the Old Testament. Rend, everybody say rend. Isaiah says, oh God, would you rend the heavens and come down? Now check this out. 700 years later, God sent his son, Jesus. And when he first came, people didn't recognize and realize who he was. And I'm certain they didn't even connect him to Isaiah 64 and that prophetic cry out to God that you would tear the heavens and come down. But he came. And Colossians would describe him as this. Let's read it out loud together in Colossians. Ready? Go. 
For in Jesus, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ, you have been brought to what? In Christ, oh God, you have been brought to fullness. Again, some people recognize them, I'm, I'm sure, right away. Emmanuel, remember? Christmas. God is with us. Some people probably were confused and they weren't sure, like maybe some of you. And some people just outright dismissed him, disregarded him. But I can promise you one thing. When an event happened at the cross and resurrection that I'm about to show you, those who knew their Hebrew Bibles, those who knew the Old Testament, it was unmistakable that this was the one that the prophet Isaiah spoke about 700 years earlier. Let me show you what I mean. If you're in Isaiah 64, turn over to Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verses 51 to 54. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was what? Torn in two. The word is rend there. The curtain of the temple was rended or torn into from what church? Bottom to top? No, 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 no. From what? Top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. This is a little weird. Just want you to know, this is a little weird right here. When I, when I read this right here, I, I, I grew up in the 80s. Um, I kind of think about the monsters. Remember that? that the, the, or, or Michael Jackson's, right? The tomb, the tombs crack. I got to think about Thriller, if you will. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Others of you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? The, the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. Check this out. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Watch this, verse 54. When the centurion... And those with him regarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened. They were what? I'd have been terrified too. They were terrified and exclaimed, read this last part with me. They exclaimed what? Surely he was the son of God. One more time. Surely he was the son of God. Now church, I gotta tell you, I will never forget the moment I connected Isaiah 64, 1 to Matthew 27, 51. I was at Duke, uh, I was in a New Testament class. It was a beautiful spring day, a lot like today. Dr. Richard Hayes said, you know what? We are not gonna sit in this classroom. Let's go outside and study on the lawn. And so we went outside and we were sitting out right in front of Duke Chapel and we were studying the New Testament and I was doing a word study on Hebrews 64 and I connected this word Ren to Matthew 27 and it was like my jaw dropped down and I could not believe 700 years prior, Isaiah uses this word that he would tear open the heavens. 700 years later, Jesus shows up, lives among us 30 years, shows us how to live life, shows us how to love, shows us how to serve, shows us all of those things that, that really equal life at its best. But then he went to the cross. At age 30, he started his ministry, lived three years of ministry. He died on a blood-stained cross for you and for me. And when he died... And when he went into the grave, and when he rose from the grave, something absolutely supernatural happened. The curtain of the temple, and this is not, this is not a big curtain. Like, like, I've got this up here now, and this is pretty cool. This is, this is, we're trying to replicate it. This is about nine feet wide, by the way. The curtain temple was 30 by 30. In fact, let me show you, let me, let me just show you a little bit of a historical context. Let me show you some pictures. If you've been to the Holy Land, some of you have seen this with me. This is, this is a picture of the temple. This is massive. You might not know how big this is just from looking at it, but this temple would be as, as big as one of our parking lots. Not all of our parking lots, but if you just go ahead, the parking lot where the basketball courts is, for example, right here to my right, your left. If you're watching online, come see us, come play ball with us any day of the week. We leave it open for everybody. Come on in. We're not a church that puts chains up and says, you know, don't enter. No, 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 come on in. If you do that right on your way out, you can look at it. It's, it's big, it's giant. And check this out. 
This area right here, <clears throat> see, this, see this wall that goes around the temple? This area was called the Gentile courtyard. The Gentile courtyard. And so that means that people like me, I could not even go into the temple because I'm a Gentile and you are too. Look at your neighbor and say, you Gentile. <laughs> Some of y'all did that too good, too good. Uh, now, if you're a Jewish person, I'm not talking to you. Jewish people could be in here, but follow me here for a moment. All the Gentiles, which means non-Jewish, that would be mostly you and me. We had to hang in this area. If you were a Jew, a lower class Jew, or a woman, I'm sorry, but this was the culture they live in, a woman, you could hang in this area right here, this first courtyard area. And if you know your, your Old Testament, the, the golden lamp stands would typically be on this left-hand side over here. And then you would, this is where the, the larger masses hung, but then you could go through this door. See this door here? There was a curtain there. That's not the curtain we're talking about in Matthew 27, 51. This is a smaller curtain. But if you could go through that curtain, the next class, the next religious elite group, right? The schnitzi group, maybe, maybe those that went to the right school, studied the right Hebrew Bible, whatever the case may be, they were good enough, right? The Pharisees and the like. They could hang out in this area, which was called the holy place. And in this area, let's go to that next picture. Give them a different look. This, is, this might look real to you, and this is pretty fascinating, by, by the way. This is a model. If you go there with me in a couple years, we're gonna go back, love to have you go. But we'll stand looking over this little cliff area and that is a replica, that is a model that is about the size of this worship center right here, okay? So this model shows you what I'm talking about. This is that area where the more religious elite could go in here. On this right-hand side would be the altar where they would sacrifice the lambs without blemish. Okay, you guys know, you know that in the Old Testament, I know it sounds barbaric and old school, but check it out. In the Old Testament, the way ancient Israel received propitiation for their sins or forgiveness of their sins, they would sacrifice lambs without blemish. And they would sacrifice it right here in this area. Here's the first curtain, here's the second curtain. Now let's go to the final slide that'll put some words to all of this. This is where, see the slaughter table? That was right there. This is that women's, women's courtyard in the Leslie. Here we are, a bunch of pagans, Gentiles. We're out here. Now, this is what's called the holy place or what you probably know it as the holy of holies. And the holy of holies is where they housed the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence fully. Now, what's interesting is the priest, the high priest, would come in here, they would sacrifice the lambs without blemish. He would take the blood of the lamb. He and only he would go into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. He would only go one day a year, the day of atonement, and he would make atonement for the sins of the people into the Holy of Holies. If you go to 1 Kings, we won't go there now, but the 1 Kings tells us about the dimensions of the Holy of Holies. It's given in cubits, but a cubit equals 18 inches. Here's what we know about the temple. This area was 30 by 30 by 30. 30 feet high, 30 feet wide, 30 feet deep. The curtain of the temple was approximately 30 by 30. It was a massive curtain, two inches thick. It was always purple or red, and so 30 by 30, I haven't measured it, but I can tell you that 30 by 30 would probably be from about right here to the far side of that stage. Giant, thick curtain that was used to keep all the people like you and me out of the presence of God. Only the holy man could go through the curtain on the day of atonement. And yet, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, that giant curtain tore from top to bottom, signifying that we all now have access to God. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter where you went to school or didn't go to school. It doesn't matter what you did last night or you didn't do last night. It doesn't matter if you're clergy or normal folk. Listen, we are all equal and the ground is level at the foot of the cross and we all stand here together and we now have 
full access to God. Praise His name. I say it like this in my notes. I say this, through the atoning death and glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, all people, everybody say all people, everyone, hey, there you go, everyone is welcome and now has full access to God, praise his holy name. A great New Testament scholar by the name of R.T. France put it like this, He said, the tearing of the curtain of the temple is surely understood as a symbol for the opening of full access to God through the death and resurrection of Jesus. From the top to the bottom, not bottom to top, demonstrates that this was the work not of man, but of God. That is what this eucatastrophe is all about. That is what makes this eucatastrophe the eucatastrophe of all eucatastrophes, where God has opened up his presence and said, come one, come all, you are all welcome to come into my presence. Edwin Markin had a great quote, and I've taken a little liberty just to replace a word or two, and here it is. You drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout, but God and love had the wit to win and God drew a circle, come on, and took me in. Now Jesus comes along, like I said, 700 years later. I've already mentioned the lambs that they would sacrifice. I've already shown you where that slaughter table was in the temple. Jesus comes along and at the age of 30, he starts his ministry He comes walking by the Sea of Galilee. If you go to John's gospel, you'll find this. And in John chapter one, verse 29, they look at Jesus and they say, behold, the Lamb of God, who what, church, who what? Takes away the sins of the world. He was the once and for all substitutionary atonement where he was the once and for all lamb that was without blemish, perfect, without sin, shed his blood for your forgiveness and mine. Ephesians 1, 7, I love the message translation of this one. I'm gonna ask you at all the campuses or those of you who are online, read this out loud really strong with me. Ready, go. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, His blood poured out, I love this next phrase, poured out on what? The altar of the cross, the Messiah, because of his blood poured out on the altar of the cross. Let's continue. We're a free people, free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds and not just barely free either. What does it say? (laughs) Abundantly free. And if the Son has set you free, mm, you are free indeed. And so I just gotta ask you today, have you received that gift? If you have, you come here a believer that I know that all this just fires you up because there's nothing like the gospel story, amen? But it would be so remiss of me on an Easter to not make sure every single person here has the opportunity to stand before the altar of the cross and realize that God has made a way. When he hung on that cross, he said lots of different things. You know most of them probably. You remember this one? Tetalista, remember that? Tetalista, arms spread wide, saying, I love you this much. And then right before he breathed his last earthly breath, this is on Good Friday, this is before Easter Sunday, he says, Tetalista, it is finished. What's finished? What's finished? Many things are finished, 
But here's what's mostly finished. You no longer have any barriers to keep you from the full presence of God. You no longer need a person to usher you into the presence of God. It is finished trying to earn your salvation based on put what you do. No, no, no. This salvation is based upon what ha he has done. It is finished your sin debt. It is finished your guilt. It is finished your death and possible condemnation to a place called hell forever. It is finished and it all went down it all went down it all went down on a good Friday and on that Friday when Jesus hung on a cross and the temple was before everyone to see and he went into Jerusalem on Monday, Thursday. Remember what they said when he went into Jerusalem? Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. You know what Hosanna means? Lord, save us now. And as he went in to Jerusalem, those same cries that said, Hosanna, save us now before weeks in, we're yelling, crucify him! That's the catastrophe of sin. And the wages of sin, Romans 3.23, is what? Death. But Romans 6.23 says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. That it is only in and through Jesus that you now can come to God the Father. One day you will stand before God. I hate to break it to you. The Bible says that every single person will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And when you stand before God, all of your misdeeds, in the words of Ephesians, the message translations, the more appropriate word is sin. All of your sins all of my sins, and they are many, will flash before the eyes of a holy God. And in that moment, I will be condemned. I will be damned, if you will, because I'm dead in my sin. But the good news is in that very moment, God the Father will look at his son, Jesus, who the Bible says sits at the right hand of God the Father. And if you've received the Christmas gift of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, and if you've received the gift of Easter, where he died on a cross for you, and the temple, the temple curtain was torn, if you have received that, then you can stand before God and know that I now have access to a holy God. It's the greatest news the world has ever known. But you have to receive it. It's the gift, and you have to take it. I don't know about you, but I've actually been viewing pretty much all of life these days through 2020 and the COVID-19 virus. And again, I'm so glad that we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. But if you can just indulge me for a moment to think like a pastor, this is what I do. You know, the truth is 2020 rocked our worlds. A year ago, we were sucker punched with a virus. And the truth is, I don't know about you, but I don't think we'll ever look at the words virus and vaccinations the same again. We're, we're forever changed. And the truth is, it sucker punched us, and the truth is, many of us got sick. And the unfortunate truth is, we lost a lot of people. But again, I don't know if you've thanked God, but I hope you'll leave today grateful that for some unknown reason, he left you here. He left you here. And if you ain't dead, he ain't done. If you ain't dead, he ain't done with you. But just stick with me here for a moment. The virus spread like wildfire. And here we are, we've lost all sense of normalcy. Anxiety has been on the rise. Suicide has been on the rise. And maybe you are aware of this, but thankfully, praise be to God, we have three powerful and potent vaccines now. Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. And the truth is, the world is celebrating that. 
And the truth is, many of us, I could do a show of hands, and probably most of you have already gotten it or you're lined up to get in. And the good news is, everybody who wants to get it, you're gonna be able to get it. But I was thinking this week about all of this and this message that I'm talking to you about today. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but the truth is, we've all been born with a virus. We were infected with a virus the day we were born. I'm talking about the virus of sin. And you might say, but oh, hold on, man, you don't know me and I didn't have anything to do with it. I know I don't know you. And you didn't have anything to do with it. Neither did I. We had no choice in the gig. We were born into sin. God gave us free will. And ever since he gave us free will and created us in the beginning, we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I don't care how good of a person you are. Listen, you still fall short of the glory of God. But here's the good news. 2,000 years ago, 700 years after the prophet Isaiah, God looked down upon his creation that had been infected with this sin virus from the beginning. And he said, enough is enough. And he put to bed, put to rest, the death penalty of sin once and for all for anyone who would receive it. All of us can sit back and celebrate these three vaccines, right? Pfizer, one shot, followed by another shot, separated by 21 days. Moderna, one shot, followed by 28 days, and another shot. Johnson & Johnson, one shot only, right? We can celebrate that, but stick with me for a moment and I'm done. If you don't go and get it, you won't receive the benefits of it. You follow me? You tracking with me? In the same way, if you don't step up and receive the fact that God has provided the once and for all vaccination against the virus of sin in and through Jesus. If you don't receive it, you won't benefit from it. And he says, I'm making it available to every single living, breathing person. Let me make it plain. God has injected planet Earth 2,000 years ago with his son to take care of your virus and my virus known as sin. He will forgive your sin past present and future, and he will give you power to overcome your sin. And when you fall short and you come back to God and you confess your sin and you ask for forgiveness, his grace abounds until you stand before him one day. And if you are in Christ, he will look down upon you and he'll give us those words that we all long for. Well done good and faithful servant. You have received the gift of my son, Jesus. You've received this eternal divine vaccination for the virus of sin. And if you have not, and again, I hate to break it to you, and I know this is not politically correct, but I don't give a flying flip about being politically correct. If you don't mind, I'm your pastor. I wanna be biblically correct. And the Bible says that every single one of us will stand before God. And if you have not received Jesus, he will look at you and he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. But if you have received Jesus, he will say, well done. Good and faithful servant come into the kingdom of heaven that has been prepared for you. And so I wanna give you a chance to do that today. I don't wanna drag it out. You know whether God's been speaking to you or not. If you're a believer, you're just gonna leave fired up and thankful that you're already saved. Amen? But for those of you who are here, and you're not sure, like you, you just don't know, I wanna give you a chance to know that you know. For me, October 23rd, 1988, I shall never forget it. It's my spiritual birthday, changed my life forever. It was the day that I stopped playing games and gave my life to God. I received what he had done for me on the altar of the cross. And I stepped into the presence of God. Let's pray together. Heads bowed, eyes closed all over this place. We have time, so if it is okay with you, I'm just gonna give you a few seconds to think about those things that might be separating you from God. 
I started out having you think about those things. What, what are those? Your thought life, actions or habits that you just can't seem to shake, things you do over and over again, maybe some things that have been done to you, but they just send you into a tailspin, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And you just feel like there's this great divide, this chasm between you and this altar of the cross, between you and the full presence of God. And if you were going to stand before God today or tomorrow or whenever it's your time and it's my time, do you know that you've crossed from death to life? Do you know that you fully opened up your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, your entire life and you received the gift of eternal life in and through Jesus And I want to encourage you to do what I did on October 23rd so many years ago. I want to encourage you to just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. And I need to receive this forgiveness of sin. I need to know that I know that when I pass from this world into the next, my eternal destiny will be a place called heaven and not a place called hell. If that's you and you desire to receive that, would you just lift up a hand right now, right where you are? Just lift it up. I wanna pray for you. I wanna pray for you. I see you. Just lift it up high. Yes, I see you too. Praise God. It's between you and God, but it, oh, I see you folks over here. Absolutely. Campuses, I'm sure that's going on there. I see you in the balcony. Yes. Praise God. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing right now. Lift it up high. The Spirit of God is moving in your heart right now. And you know that you need to give your life to him. Keep your hands up. Those of you who lifted it up, pray with me. Just, just say a simple prayer like this in your spirit. You don't have to say it out loud. Just say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. And I need you to be my savior. So I invite you into my life today. I invite you into my life to stay. You are Lord you are Savior, and I will follow you all the days of my life. And then say this, say, Lord Jesus, send your Holy Spirit into my life. Take control of my life, and when I fall short, Lord God, I'm gonna come back to you. I'm gonna confess and repent of my sin. And today, on Easter 2021, I give you my life. Thank you for giving me your life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not what? Perish, but have everlasting life. Just tell the Lord Jesus, say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for adopting me as a son or a daughter of the most high God. Father, for the believers here, we just celebrate and we're so grateful for what you've done for us. We're so grateful for the story that never gets old. We too give you our lives afresh and anew today. We re rededicate ourselves before the altar of this cross and we declare once again, we are yours. Use us for your glory and your honor, bless us indeed that we might be a blessing for the world. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, church, you know what to do. That's right. You know what to do. For those of you who raised your hand, those of you here, those of you here up there in the balcony, hey, welcome to the family of God. We are so glad you are here.